Honestly, we could sing that song every week and be totally fine with me. We could, that's going to be one that's on repeat in heaven, and I'm excited about it. Just so you know, heads up today, there could be a problem. Uh, this last week, uh, a couple things. I am on a steroid for a little medical thing that I've got going on, and on Tuesday, our dog jumped up on the table and took the packet of steroids and ate them all. So like days three through seven of my steroids, he ate them. Then yesterday, he jumped up on the table and took my little clicker and devoured that thing, so it's all shattered. So if it stops, like I wanted to scold him, but unfortunately, he'd eaten the steroids, so he's jacked now, and I'm not going to mess with the dog. Um, so if this thing like starts malfunctioning or something, I'll just have to go around and click it behind, but it uh, could be a rough morning. Next week, I need you to read Jonah, the first chapter. Okay, back to something a little more familiar for many of you, Jonah chapter one for next week, a man on the run, the story of Jonah, at least the beginning of the story of Jonah. This week was Amos chapter 5, because I wanted you to feel really good about yourself. I had you read the fifth chapter of Amos. I don't know if you've ever heard of a bait and switch before. I, I, I shouldn't say that. Most of you have heard of a bait and switch, but if I put you on the spot and I ask you what is a bait and switch, you might not be able to explain it. To me, one of the easiest ways to define things is to give examples. If you hear an example, then you know what that is. So a couple of bait and switches that have happened to me just recently, mind you. American Income Life Insurance Company. Okay, as a teacher, I'm a member of the uh, Teachers Credit Union in Kokomo. Like, we got an account, our checking is with First Farmers. But then our savings we do through the credit union. Well, every so often in the uh, statements that you get from the credit union, there's this little paper in there that says, because of your membership, you're eligible for this, I don't know, it's something like a $2,500 accidental death uh, gift. So like if you die, your wife gets $2,500. And I've never checked, it's free. I just never checked the box because, eh, I mean, I'm dead, so it doesn't really matter. But then, <laughs> Jenny was really nice to me, so when I got it, I, I went ahead and checked the box and sent it in because it's just free, right? It's just free money. That's the bait. So I started getting these phone calls from the American Income Life Insurance Company saying that they wanted to come and deliver the certificate from our I was like, well, can you mail it to me? Well, no, we need to come and deliver because we need to explain the whole thing. What is there to explain? You, I die, you write me a check. That's the way that this works. But whatever. So I asked the lady, well, how long will it take? And she said, it shouldn't take too long. So I said, all right, Wednesday evening at like 5.30 because Jenny has to leave not long after that for soccer practice. So I asked Jenny. She said, it's fine. The lady comes at 5.30. At 7.30, she's still there. She leaves my home roughly 8 o'clock. So this is a two and a half hour meeting. And you say, why did it take so long? Because after the five minute presentation of my $2,500 certificate that I can exchange when I die, because I'm sure I'm going to keep track of that thing, as soon as that was done, she breaks out the portfolio to explain all of the various options that American Income Life Insurance Company has. And she goes on for two and a half hours hours about the whole thing and she's really good because at the end she says so that's the enhanced package but if you feel more comfortable with the basic package we could just do that is that what you would like to do and I felt really bad but I said no I don't want to do any of this I feel really bad that you took two and a half hours I just thought I was getting a twenty five hundred dollar check for kicking it but you went on to this whole I don't really want any of this that is a bait and a switch another example of a bait and switch was booking flights recently Went to Allegiant, right? Because Allegiant has cheap flights. It was a lot cheaper than all of the others. It was only $68 for a flight to Orlando. So we're doing it, baby. So I buy the $68 flight, and then it takes me to the next screen. You know what the next screen is? Your bag. Yeah, my bag. I don't get a bag when I go. I just have to go with like my toothbrush in my pocket. All right, well, I got to have a bag. 
And so then I look, it's $50 for a bag. So now my $68 ticket isn't really $68. This thing's $118 is what it really is. But then it dawned on me, I'm not planning on leaving my bag where I go. I'm going to want that bag to come back with me. So that's going to be another $50. So now I'm up to a $168 ticket. Well, this isn't the deal that I thought it was. And I click the button, and then it takes me to the next screen. You know what the next screen is? Pick your seat. How is it that you can buy a ticket on an airplane and not have a seat to sit in? What is that? Like the $68 should go in the, in the luggage rack above or maybe underneath the plane? Is there a ticket or a charge for the blanket? Because when it gets to 10000 it's going to get chilly in the baggage hold. This is bait and switch. And we all see that all the time. You get baited with something and then the deal changes on you. Right? Okay, a bait and switch is also a rhetorical advice, uh, a device. Authors will use that. Effective authors will use it. They'll get you to let your guard down with what they're writing. And then once you've let your guard down, they hit you with the point that they were trying to bring. And it works for apostles also. I don't know how many of you were with us in our uh, community here when we were going through the book of Romans, when we were doing the gospel. But if you remember, there's that passage in Romans 1 that we Christians today, looking at the ungodliness of the world, we always cite it. You remember this part? That they, uh, God turned them over to the shameful lusts because they had rejected him. God gave them over to a depraved mind, and then we start reaming the rest of the world. They're filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They're gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. And all of us Christians, just like all of those Christians then, were like, you get them, Paul, get them. All these ungodly people, let them know what's coming. God's going to get them for all their sinfulness. And then what happens? Chapter 2. You, Christians, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment, you do the same things. And remember, we're left saying, well, I don't murder people. I don't do all of that. And then we get the teaching that what we're doing in our heart, in God's eyes, is the same as doing it with our bodies. That we are just as guilty of all of these things. The bait and switch worked for Paul when he was addressing Christians in the New Testament. And it also works for prophets, prophets like Amos. That's what I had you read this week. Let me give you a quick background. If you don't know this, the Old Testament is not laid out chronologically. It seems like it would be a lot easier if it was. But the reason I need to point that out is because Amos is actually speaking before where we've been the last few weeks. Jeremiah and then the book of Daniel in exile, that all happened after Amos did his preaching. Okay? Amos is actually speaking to the northern kingdom of Israel. Remember they had their civil war? You had Israel up here and Judah down here. And then Israel gets destroyed by the Assyrians. And then Judah's hanging out. And then that's Jeremiah. And then they get destroyed by Babylon. And then they're in exile. Okay, so let me show you the map here because this is always fun, mapping it out. Here's where Amos is right here. And then down here is where Jeremiah is and Daniel. So Amos is before all of this happens. It's good, right? Took some time finding that map. I thought it was really effective. Amos is speaking before Assyria has come and wiped out the northern kingdom. Now, I didn't have you read it, but in Amos chapter 1, the prophet goes after all of these ungodly nations that are threatening Israel and God's people. He's reaming them. He's destroying them. He's condemning Israel's enemies because of their injustice and their violence. And the whole time the prophet Amos is doing this, you know what the Israelites are doing. They're cheering him on. You go, Amos, absolutely right. All these despicable, ungodly people all around us, they need to be condemned. God needs to punish them. And then all of a sudden, Amos turns and starts denouncing Israel for doing the exact same thing. It was the bait and switch. And if you flip to Amos 2, you would see that, right? It is a classic bait and switch, just like Paul did with the Romans. All these evil things that people around you are doing, and then he turns and says Israel's doing the same thing, and Israel now has no escape. You say, well, why don't they have an escape? Why, what, what do you mean by that? Well, here's the deal. They have applauded God for announcing judgment on all of these ungodly people, right? Now, by the way, see if you see any parallel here. They are applauding God because he has announced he is going to punish the evil of injustice of all of these other nations. They are acknowledging that is worthy of condemnation. And then Amos turns around and says, it's interesting that you think that because you all do the same thing. You have already said that that should be condemned. And now I'm proving to you that you do the exact same thing. 
He hits them for violence and oppression. You saw that. Amos chapter 5. If you've got it, you can flip back to Amos chapter 5. I know you really don't ever want to read this chapter again, but do it this morning to humor me. Verse 11. You, Israel, you, God's people, you trample on the poor and force him, the poor guy, to give you grain. You're forcing the poor man to keep you fed. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. You oppress the righteous and take bribes, and you deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, the prudent man keeps quiet in such times, for the times are evil. So he is hitting Israel for violence and oppression. Here's what the wealthy are doing. The wealthy are taking advantage of the poor. They are getting wealthy off the backs of the poor, and they use bribes to pay off the court system. So they're abusing poor people, and then when they should be getting in trouble for it, they use their wealth that they've gotten off of the poor people to bribe the courts so they get out of it. That's what's happening in Israel at this point in time. And it's so common, and it's so widespread, that look at verse 13. The prudent... That means godly people, people who know better, they kept silent. They don't speak out about all this injustice. Why? Because it's an evil time, because they fear retribution. If I speak out about this injustice and this evil, I'm going to get hammered as well, so I'm going to keep my mouth shut. The righteous knew it would do no good to speak to this because everything is corrupt and everything is unjust and everything is evil. Amos expresses what God's punishment is going to be for all of this. Amos says, yeah, all you wealthy people, you people who have taken advantage of others to build up your stone mansions and your lush vineyards, you've gained a lot out of oppressing the poor. And it may look right now like you're going to reap the benefits, but hear me, it's not going to happen. God's not going to let this go unpunished. God's making sure you understand your exploits are only going to be temporary. God is just, and his justice will not sleep forever. Is there a message for us in all of that? Well, let's go a little bit further, because Amos isn't done. If you kept reading this, he not only hits them for violence and oppression, but he jumps all over God's people for their religious idolatry and their corruption. Look at verses 21 through 23. These are some of the most alarming verses to me in, in, in Scripture. Look at what this says. This is God speaking. I hate. Now, when God says he hates something, that is a strong emotion. It should cause us to pay attention. I don't want to be on the receiving end of what God hates. I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I won't accept them. Though you bring me choice fellowship offerings, I'll have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. God is saying, everything you're doing to be religious, I despise it. That would have shocked and offended the people of Israel. And why would it have done so? Well, observing feasts and festivals, that's the way they've always understood they honor God. And what they're hearing now from Amos is the very things that we're doing to honor God, God hates. And he wants nothing to do with those things. That would have been shocking to them. It would have been offensive to them. But God is communicating to them, please hear me, that he is offended God is offended by their ceremonies because their ceremonies are totally detached from righteousness and compassion, from justice and compassion. You are not showing any justice. You are not showing any compassion. You are not righteous, and yet you're coming into these assemblies and acting like you're one of mine. You're profaning my name is what you're doing. By the way, that should sound familiar. Do you remember what Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 5? Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar... And there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you. There's some sort of uh, of just injustice between the two of you. Leave your gift in front of the altar. Don't, Don't sacrifice it. Leave your gift. First go and be reconciled to them. Make it just. Make it righteous. And then come and make your sacrifice. Don't have this injustice in your life and then come before me and praise my name and sing my praises and make your offerings. God is telling Israel right here through Amos, please don't miss this. And I pray I'm not the only one that is picking up on a message that he's sending to his people today. Your feasts and your festivals, your burnt offerings and your grain offerings and your peace offerings and your songs and your praise, they are meaningless to me. All the stuff you do to be religious meaningless to me if there is no righteousness in your dealings with others. 
If you go out the doors after your feasts and have no justice in the way you deal with other people, have no concern for justice, you are not righteous in your dealings with your fellow human beings, you don't love your fellow man, then you are misrepresenting me and I don't want to hear any of it. That's what God is saying to the children of Israel. Now Amos is clearly a prophet speaking to people, Israel. Amos did not know that you and I would ever exist, but God did. And God has preserved the words of the prophet Amos for us to read. Why might that be? Maybe because God is speaking to us. Your church going and your praise singing, oh, you sing those songs, it's great. Your communion taking, it is meaningless to me if there is no righteousness in your dealings with others. Don't think that it matters to me if you are not righteous in your dealing. Do you wonder why the apostle says that a person should take account for themselves before they take communion? Because if they don't, what are they doing? They are eating and drinking judgment on themselves. It's the exact same thing that Amos is talking about here. If you are not righteous in your dealings with others, if you are not just and concerned with justice, then do not come and, and sing my praises. I want to take you way back. Okay, way back to where many of you were probably not here, we did a series on the Ten Commandments. I don't know if you remember the Ten Commandments series, but when we went through each of those commandments, we said that the first commandment, which is that you shall have no other gods before me, I don't want to say it's the most important, because you can't really say one's more important than another. Not murdering someone is kind of important. So we don't want to say one is more important than the other, but we did say the first commandment, to have no other gods, is a linchpin around which all of the others are built. Because if there is not God at the center of your life, then all of the other things will fall apart. There'll be no godly values. There'll be no godly virtues. If you want to do something, even if it violates a command, well, why do you care if there is no God? If God isn't the center of your life, why should you follow all of those others? Breaking the first commandment then, putting something else in the place of God, whether it's yourself or pop culture, whatever it is, that's the first domino. And all of the others are going to fall after that. And you know what you find? If you read the other prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they'll say the exact same thing. If you flipped open to Ezekiel 22, you know what you'd find? You would find Ezekiel condemning Israel for breaking all of these commandments, doing all of this horrible stuff, being awful and unrighteous. And then he concludes why it is. In verse 12, he says, you have forgotten me, declares the sovereign Lord. You forgot me, you replaced me with other gods, and as a result of that, you have broken all these other commandments, and you have been bad people as a result. And the religious theatrics, that only makes it more insulting to God. It's one thing to forget God. And it's one thing to have forgotten God and therefore do a bunch of bad stuff because he's not the center of your life. But how awful, once you have done that, to still parade around like you're some kind of religious Christian. People who are acting like the world and yet wearing the name of Christ. They had forgotten God, but they were acting like they hadn't. Offering public displays of religiousness, speaking of religious things, all while perverting justice. And God finds that. He didn't just... Yeah, God found that egregious. I'm telling you, the character of God has not changed. He finds it egregious. When his people, who claim to love him, are unjust in their dealings with others are lacking in righteousness with, they, with the way they deal with their fellow man. It is egregious in the sight of God. That's why the prophet Isaiah said this, Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. Look at these words that God is using. Okay, We talk all the time about the sins that God finds seriously. And if you ask Americans today, American Christians, what sins are the worst? Man, we list off sexual depravity and all of these other things. And yet for some reason we're blind to what God is saying he hates, he despises. It's the fake religion stuff. That's what he hates. And why? Because we're dragging his name through the mud. We're acting like the world, but we're attaching his name to it. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. I mean, I cannot read this and not fear a little bit about what we do here. Are we guilty of this? Is God saying the same thing to us? Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening because your hands are full of blood. You are not my people. My people don't act like that. 
I've given the commands of how they will act, and you are not acting like that. Listen, this is what I'm stressing. This is why I had you read Amos, the fifth chapter, because God takes matters of, of, of fake religion and counterfeit faith. He takes it very seriously. We need to as well. He makes it very clear, though, what he desires. I've gotten all worked up into a lather, and I think God knew that. And that's why right in the middle, he throws in this great verse. You remember verse 24? just sticks out like a sore thumb. It's like the only relief in this massive condemnation. Remember what verse 24 says? Read it. Uh, Martin Luther King said it in one of his speeches. I'm not going to say it nearly as impressively as he did. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. That's awesome. That's what God wants. Justice and righteousness. That's what he's after. Listen, here's the point. I'm getting now to the point of the sermon. I hope you enjoyed the introduction, all right? Here's the point of the sermon. This justice and righteousness, that is the character of God, and therefore it must be the character of his people. It must be the character of his people. Now, let's be honest about where this conversation always goes. Everybody's going to get uncomfortable now, so I am the master of discomfort. Let's talk about this, where this goes. When I start talking justice, what do we do? Even God's people, this is part of our problem, everything is political. So the moment the idea of justice comes up, we start to gravitate towards our man-made political tribes. And we have folks on the left side of the political spectrum that will stand up and say, exactly, if the church is not speaking to the disproportionate incarceration of black people, then it is not pleasing God. And God doesn't want to hear the religious worship of those people because they do not take justice seriously. And then the people on the right side of the political aisle get all puffed up and they say, listen, if the church is not talking about the lack of justice and the wanton slaughter, I love that word, wanton, the wanton slaughter of innocent babies in the womb, do not claim to be a godly person, do not claim to care about justice if you are not talking about that injustice. And then once we've made our points, now we've got to respond to the other people's points. And the people on the left will say to the people on the right, it's interesting, you're just pro-birth. You don't care about people once they've been born, all you care about is having more babies in the world and then you don't do anything to take care of them and then the people on the right say it's interesting you only think black lives matter you don't think all the other lives matter why don't we talk about the incarceration rates of these people that are innocent it's always the black lives that matter and this is what happens and so it goes on and on this is where we are nothing is settled Nothing is accomplished. God's people are caught up in worldly debates. Nothing's achieved. No bridge is built. No justice is actually done. God is not glorified, and Satan wins. That's how it always plays out. That's how it always plays out, because we are too obsessed with worldly strategies. You see, I think one of the major reasons that is how it always plays out is because you and I don't think like godly people. We think like worldly people. We have become way too worldly in our thinking. It is worldly methods and worldly strategy. How are we going to achieve justice? Immediately, we start thinking government policy. Well, we got to figure out what the government's going to do. What laws can we pass? That's where our minds go as to how we achieve justice. We think of things that center around politics and power rather than imitating our Christ and bearing our own cross. It's very interesting how that works, isn't it? And I'm going to contend to you that Satan loves it when we focus on worldly approaches. Why? Because worldly approaches will divide people. Worldly approaches will drive people from the church. Think about it. If the church aligns itself with Black Lives Matter, then what happens? All the people on the political right will say that church is a liberal, whacked out church. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And they'll run away. And if a church aligns itself with pro-life politics, then people on the left side of the political aisle, I don't have anything to do with that church, and they'll run away from it. As long as we are aligning with Republican Jesus or Democrat Jesus, then people who don't fall into those worldly categories will want to have nothing to do with the mission of the church. Satan loves it when we play worldly games. He wants us to stay there. But imagine for a second the terror that we would inflict on Satan if we started doing godly things godly ways. If our approach wasn't to immediately gravitate to what's the political so solution, but instead did what Jesus did throughout Scripture, totally turned the understanding of power on its head. Remember what we said about Daniel last week? I can do a lot more for the kingdom of God if I'm in the palace than if I'm in the den of, of lions. God doesn't think like we think. And God has said, you want to make changes, imitate Christ and bear your cross. That's how you do it. Can you imagine for a second if we did that? If we started seeking the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit instead of the wisdom and the power of Washington, D.C., 
I mean, for heaven's sake, you see what's there, right? You see the folks that are in charge. you got to be kidding me. That's where the solutions are going to be found? How about we seek the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit to make changes, to do what the prophet Micah said? You remember Micah 6, 8? To love mercy, to do justice, and to walk humbly with our God. If we started asking the Holy Spirit to help us love mercy, not treat people with the worldly spirit of revenge, people who see things differently, no, 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 we're going to love mercy and show mercy towards them. We're going to walk humbly with God, not boast as we're strutting around posting our, our hot takes on Twitter and our little half-truth truth memes that can belittle people that don't believe like us. If we actually started being more humble about stuff and if we actually did justice. Notice what Micah says. He doesn't say talk about justice. He doesn't say take a stand for justice. He says do it. If we did justice, not sitting and arguing about policy, but doing justice, what if we took that approach, sought the Holy Spirit's power to do that? There is so much injustice in the world today. It is all around you. Everywhere in our community, it is all around you. And my question is, is our body of believers doing anything about it, or are we ignoring it in our stone mansions and our lush vineyards? We're happy with what we've got. We're content. We don't have time to worry about the injustice of the world. You remember what God said about those that do that? They're not going to live in those stone mansions. And they're not going to enjoy the benefits of that lush vineyard. And you say, okay, well, what can I do? What can I do about the injustice of the world? Well, start with opening your eyes. You know what's unjust? Let me tell you what is unjust. There are 13,000 children in the state of Indiana's foster care system right now. 13,000 kids sitting in the foster care system. And they are there due to no fault of their own. Their parents made poor choices. They entered the world. They were born. That's what they did. And because of that, they're in the foster care system and their lives are in limbo. They have absolutely no structure to their lives, no stability, no semblance of anything that, that even resembles a nuclear family. They're floating. They're just out there. That's unjust is what it is. And where are we, God's people, Many of us love to ride a political high horse. This guy did. This guy does. Oh, I'll get out there. Man, you ask me the problems of American education, buckle up, baby, because I'm happy to tell you you're never going to solve the problems of American education until you solve the problems of the American families. There's the issue. So I love to talk about the importance of family. I talk at length about the importance of family. If we believe it, then do justice for these kids. 13,000 kids in the foster care system. What is this church doing? What are we doing? Now, I know we do have foster care parents in our, our, in our body, and that's one of the reasons that this came to my mind. This is an example. You can be a foster parent, or if you can't be a foster parent, you can be a respite home. You know what a respite home is? It's people that take the foster care kids for a couple days so that the foster family, if they've got an issue they need to deal with with their biological children or there's been a meltdown in their situation, they can have a couple days of peace. You can be a respite home is what you can do as a church. Why don't we support these families? Why doesn't someone here who's got a passion for it start a ministry for foster care families and coordinate all of the foster families in the area and make them aware of everything that's going on, give them resources and help and love and take meals to them? Make sure they know when events are going on at various churches where those kids who have no godly influence can get plugged in. Why are we doing justice? We talk about it. Let's do it. You know what else is unjust? I'll tell you what else is unjust. Every year in Indiana, there are 14,000 teenage girls who become pregnant, either because of a mistake or because of a pressured or, co or, or coerced uh, sexual encounter. And you know what happens with the dude? Dude usually maybe is on the periphery of the situation, but largely is out of the picture. As so you got a young teenage girl who is pregnant. The question that I've got is, are we doing justice to support and provide for them and their child? There's a crisis pregnancy center, a pregnancy resource center right here in Kokomo. Does this church invest in that? Do we invest in that? This church is great about giving to missions. There's a mission field right outside our door. Are we investing in those things? Are we doing justice or do we just talk about this? A Christian businesswoman is harassed because she wants to stay true to her godly conscience and not provide a service that she believes will offend God. And because of the culture that we live in, what happens? She is flooded with negative press. She's attacked on social media. She loses contracts and income. And her business is going under. Do we, as godly people, do justice and support her and her work? Do we love her? 
Or do we say, man, I'm glad that's not me. I'm glad I'm not in the crosshairs of our current cultural situation. An interracial couple suffers verbal harassment or even worse. You do remember, some of you, that this actually happened in our community just a few years ago. An interracial couple moved in and got something left on their front door. It's horrific. It's bad stuff, right? And the, re the reason I remember it is because all the people that used to be here but have left Greentown, when they heard about it, what did they do? Oh, it's what they love to do. They descend upon social media to talk about, well, that's Greentown mentality for you. Well, that's exactly right. I live there. I know how bad it is there. Those backwoods hicks. Man, that's exactly what you would expect for them. As if there isn't 20 times more bigotry in all of these progressive enclaves like New York City and San Francisco than there is in Greentown, Indiana. But it's what makes some people happy to live on Twitter and deride their upbringing, so be it. You know what those voices didn't do? I'll tell you what those voices didn't do. They didn't talk about what actually happened in this community. Some of you were involved in it. The godly people showed up and the next day, the next day built a security fence, a privacy fence all around that home so the kids could go out in the yard and play out of fear, not, so they wouldn't uh, be playing in fear. That's what happened there. Notice what did Christians do? They didn't waste time going back and forth on social media about the qualities of Greentown. They didn't spend their time smacking gums about politics or systemic problems or structural issues. I'm not saying that those things don't exist, but that's not where Christians were focused. They weren't hashtagging on Twitters to stand in solidarity with, with the family. They, they weren't going to Instagram and posting a big black square so that everybody could know that they were doing something when in fact they weren't doing anything except just being online. No, what they did was justice. They got involved in the situation and did something. And even when there is systemic injustice that takes place, a lot of us don't even understand what that is. It'd be helpful to understand what it is so Christians can actually do justice. I don't know if you know who Tony Evans is. Tony Evans is a minister. He's awesome. Down in Texas. And Denny Bagley and I listened to uh, a sermon that he just did. a two-part sermon. And it was on critical race theory and what he called kingdom race theology. He's got a largely black congregation. But across from Tony Evans' church, he gave the best explanation of what um, a systemic injustice is. He said, across the street from our church, there is a big golf course, big golf club. And it's one of those that's been around for a long time. And you remember the golf clubs where black people were not allowed to go to those golf clubs, yes? Okay. Well, we went through an era where all the laws changed. So everything's fine now, right? There's no more injustice. The laws have changed, and you can't prohibit a black person from being in the club. Well, Evans explained, no, this is how systemic injustice works. They changed it so that, yes, black people can be involved, but the way that you become a member, a current member of the course, a current member of the club has to sponsor you, okay? And then once you've been sponsored, 75% of the membership of the club has to vote you into the club and its secret ballot. Okay, so no, they can gladly say, we're not prohibiting black people from being in the club, but they set up a system by which those people are never going to be approved. That's how it happens. And even today, when largely people are not racist in that way and would keep a black person out, maybe a majority are voting in favor of that individual. you got to have 75%. You set up a system to accomplish a, a racist objective. That's the idea of systemic injustice. You know what Tony Evans' church did? They did not stage a sit-in to draw attention to themselves. That's not their approach. They didn't mar march on the state house demanding some sort of legal change. The laws had already been changed. They didn't call their congressmen so that they could get MSNBC to come down and do a town hall meeting and draw attention for the church. You know what these Christians did? They actually did justice. I love this. You know what they did? They bought the golf course. That's what they did. They raised the money. It's a wealthy church. They bought the golf course and totally changed the rules for membership. That's doing justice. That's what we're talking about. We do things differently. Christians, this is why I had you read Amos 5. Because God is serious about justice. He is serious about righteousness. And the degree to which we demonstrate that we are too, that is the degree to which we are representing him and his interest in justice to a watching world. Amos, his words stressed to God's people then the sin of injustice and the false piety and the idolatry that goes with it. And I'm suggesting to you that God has preserved those words for us to hear in our time as well. And I'm praying they don't fall on deaf ears. Father, I thank you that you are a God of justice. I thank you that you are a God of compassion. I thank you that you are a God of righteousness. 
Father, forgive us for the times that we have spent happily sitting in our stone mansions, enjoying the fruit of our lush vineyards, and not paying attention to the injustice that surrounds us. Father, I pray that our hearts would be convicted, that the wealth that you have given us, we would see as a blessing and a gift to then invest in the world, to do right by others, to be different than what the world is. Father, not to bicker and argue about man-made political ends that will never have any resolution, but instead to do justice and to love mercy. Father, that's the kind of Christian I want to be, and I pray that you would make me that way. And Father, I pray the same for every individual here whose heart is open to your message of truth. A chapter that maybe wasn't the easiest to read, but Father, so important for us to hear. You take these things seriously, so may we take them seriously as well. That is our prayer, and we ask it in the name above every other name, the King of justice himself, Jesus Christ, and everyone said, Amen.